Hi everyone, welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host, Chitendra. This is a conversation with Jesse Christensen. Dr. Christensen is a research scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute based at Caltech. Her research work focuses on studying different exoplanet systems, their occurrence rates, and exoplanet catalogs. In this conversation, we talk about the TESS and Kepler missions. How do we find new exoplanets? atmosphere of the exoplanets, biosignatures, alien life, and how can people contribute in hunting new exoplanets. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi, Jesse. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, to start with, uh, what's the latest count of the exoplanets now? (laughs) Ah, we are up to 5,014, I think. Wow, that's that's fascinating, and and it, this is like really the exponential increase, right? The in, yeah, in- yeah, yeah. If you look at the number of exoplanets over the last thirty years since they were first discovered in nineteen ninety two, you can actually fit an exponential curve. And now, you know, two years into the pandemic, everybody knows what an exponential looks like. But that's also what exoplanets have been doing. So we just hit five thousand last month, which was very exciting. Yeah, so from the same curve, let's talk about uh, your career. Uh, where is that? Where is your career in this exponential curve? Do you think you are, you are uh, growing in the same way? Yeah, so I, um, yes, yeah, so about 10 years after planets started to be discovered was when I joined the hunt uh, as a grad student. Um, and I spent four years looking for exoplanets and I didn't find any. And then I spent another two years looking for exoplanets as a postdoc and I didn't find any. Uh, and then finally I joined NASA uh, and I joined the Kepler mission, which we'll talk more about. And then I started to find thousands of exoplanets. Uh, so many of those 5,000 exoplanets were discovered by Kepler and I was on the Kepler science team. So I was very lucky to be involved in many of those. So yes, my curve is also flat for a long time and then shoots up. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I mean, of course, we'll talk more about why you didn't find the exoplanets before, because that's mm-hmm. interesting. But let's let's uh, rewind a little bit more and uh, uh, talk a bit more about before the uh, before your graduation school. And uh, so, were you always interested in astronomy? I was. So when I was in um, high school, uh, I lived out in the countryside in Australia. So I lived at a really nice dark site where there were no cities nearby, so no lights. Uh, And if you're ever able to go to a properly dark site and look up at the sky, it's just astonishing. Like it would take your breath away. The sky is so beautiful. Um, So I was always super, super into the sky. I actually started my high school's first astronomy club, um, Nerd Alert, by the way, in case that wasn't obvious. Um, but I never actually knew that you could do astronomy as a career. I didn't realize it was something you could get paid to do. Um, I'm a first generation college student, so neither of my parents or anyone in my family before me had gone to college. Um, so there were a lot of these like academic research careers that I just had no idea about. Um, so it wasn't until I actually went to university, I actually started a degree in biotechnology um, because uh, this was, you know, I was applying for college in the late 90s and, you know, cloning was just getting really exciting. We had Dolly the sheep had just been cloned. So I was like, well, that sounds interesting. Um, So I started university not doing astronomy, not hunting for planets, um, but actually doing biotechnology. And then after about six months, I was like, oh no, I don't want to do this. I don't like this at all. Um, but that by that point, I was actually at a university and I was seeing all these different professors with their different labs and they're doing all of this different research. And I was like, wait, can you just do astronomy as a job? Um, so then I switched my major. Um, so I switched to physics and maths. Unfortunately, the university didn't have a major in, in astronomy. There was just one astronomy course in the like third year of the degree that I just like waited for for two years to do this one astronomy course. Um, so I knew, I knew I wanted to pivot into astronomy, but it took a, it was a circuitous route from like loving astronomy in high school to ending up with a PhD in astronomy. Took a, took a few turns. 
Yeah, that's that's fascinating, and I think I don't know how easy it is now to to change the fields, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. But maybe then you can also kind of understand, you know, more of this astrobiology part since you you have a like, yeah yeah. Since my first year or so of university was doing a lot of biology and chemistry, and then molecular chemistry, so I have a bit of a background more so than like my husband has been doing astronomy from the start, uh, so he doesn't have kind of this like more general science education, but he's got a deeper astronomy education it's interesting the difference between like the Australian system and the American system yeah so uh, now let's go, go back to that topic so why couldn't you find exoplanets in, in for, for about five to six years in, in yeah, your, yeah 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 so I mean the crux of the matter is that planets are very small and very dark compared to the stars that they are orbiting around so if you think about our solar system we have the sun which is 99% the mass of our solar system is in the sun. And, you know, 99.9999% of the light coming from our solar system is coming from the sun. And then you have our eight planets. So you have the small rocky planets that are, you know, mass wise, they're very small and brightness wise, they're very faint. And then you have the giant planets, which are a bit bigger and a bit brighter, but really nothing compared to the sun. Um, so what we were doing in kind of the early 2000s was called transit surveys. So this is one of the ways we find planets. And what you do is like, imagine this is a star and you're a planet going around the star. If you're lined up just right, you block the light from the star. So you block a little bit of the light. Um, so what we do is the measurement's actually really easy. You just measure the brightness of every star with time and you wait for a little dip in the brightness as a planet goes in front. Um, so we started, there were like 20 groups around the world who were trying to do this from the ground. Now, the problem is from the ground, it's really tough because the atmosphere is changing on about the same level that the brightness is changing because of the planet going in front of the star. So there's just our atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere is really annoying for astronomers. Like we need it to breathe, but almost all of us would just like wish it away if we could, because it's, it gets in the way of our, of our measurements. Um, so we were trying to do this from the ground and I was just fighting against all of this other systematic noise in my data, the atmosphere, the stars, the instrument, and the signal of the planet was just so small that it was getting hidden. It was buried in all of these other noise sources. So one of the big successes of the last two decades is sending these instruments to space. So this is what NASA did. Um, so with the Kepler mission and then the TESS mission, you take your transit survey, you take your camera that's just measuring brightness over time, you take it off the ground, take it through the atmosphere and you put it in space. So it's above the atmosphere and all of the annoying noise sources of the atmosphere and the sun coming up and down every day. Um, and you can just observe for months at a time, uh, look for these little dips and the, the data are just so much better. It's unbelievable. It's just magic. Um, so yes, the first, the first six years I was working with data that weren't great. And then I joined Kepler and I started to work with the best data in the world. And it was wonderful. And this is also, I think, interesting that the, the the fact that there is a huge difference of like having telescopes on the ground or, or having them in the in the space. Um, yeah, um, it's that's, it's really yeah. hard to explain how much better it is. It's just so much better. It almost looks like a model. Like if you drew a line of what a planet looked like going around a star, well, we had these models, we had these expectations of what that dip would look like. And the data from the ground were really noisy and, you know, kind of like wobbled all around that. So you could see, you could see a transit, but that noise was very high. And then you get the data from Kepler, which is like, voot, voot, voot. what? So Kepler was the first uh, telescope that we sent uh, in the space? So it was the first dedicated planet hunter that NASA sent into space. So there had been a few spacecraft before that that had been launched earlier that we used to try and do this. So one was the epoxy mission. Um, so this was, if you've heard of the deep impact mission, so NASA sent this telescope out to a comet. Uh, and what it did was when it got to the comet, it broke into two pieces. Uh, one piece was the impactor and it just went and slammed into the comet. And the other was the imager and it like filmed that basically and like took spectra of like the, the material that was exploded out of the comet when the thing hit it. It's like, how do you look at the inside of a comet? Let's smash one open. Um, but then afterwards, NASA was like, well, now we have this imager in space. What do we do? Um, so a few scientists were like, well, we could use it to look for transits. 
So that was actually the very first project that I worked on. But unfortunately, it was never designed to do really, really high precision brightness measurements over and over. It was designed to take an, a movie of a comet getting smashed. So the data were actually not what we needed, unfortunately. Um, and then there were a few other spacecraft from other countries that were being used. So Canada had launched the most spacecraft, which again, wasn't dedicated to this, but we used it to look for transits. And then Europe and the French space agency had launched Corot. Uh, and Corot was kind of a, a, it had two goals. One was hunting for planets and one was looking for stellar variability. So if you're measuring the brightness of stars with time anyway, you're gonna measure the ways that they vary. And almost every star varies for some reason, even our sun, if you measure the brightness with time is varying. Um, so this had two, two goals, planets and stellar variability. So Kepler wasn't the first spacecraft, but it was the first one that was launched just purely to hunt for planets. Like we built it so that it would take the right measurements very well. Uh, and it did, and it was great. And it was a huge success. And since then uh, it has discovered about or more than thousand or about thousand planet, exoplanets. Oh yeah, no, it's 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 discovered more than half of the 5,000 planets. So I think closer to 3,000 mm. planets have been discovered by Kepler now, especially if you take into account. So the original mission Kepler uh, had one question, which was how common are planets like the earth? So our earth, a rocky planet that's in the right temperature zone for liquid water, how, how often does that happen? Is it rare or is it common? Do, do thousands and millions and billions of stars throughout the galaxy have a rocky planet with the right temperature for liquid water? So that was the question Kepler was designed to answer. So it looked at this one patch of sky for four years. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't quite get there. It turns out that stars were varying more than we expected. So remember how I said when the signal is like buried in the variations, it's hard to pull out. It was harder for us to get at these tiny signals of Earth-like planets than we thought it was going to be. So we went back to NASA and we were like, hey, if you give us four more years, we'll be able to do it because we'll just be able to add more and more transits together and increase the signal to noise. And NASA were like, great, go do it. Uh, and then almost immediately, one of the reaction wheels on the spacecraft failed. So to keep the spacecraft oriented in space at one patch of sky, there were four reaction wheels, which are just like wheels that spin in different directions to kind of use conservation of momentum to keep the spacecraft pointed where you want it to be pointed. And one of them had already failed, but there was redundancy built in. You actually only needed three. Uh, but then almost after we got our extension, immediately the second reaction wheel failed. So we weren't able to keep pointed at that field anymore. So that was Kepler, which found thousands of planets. And then it became K2, which was the like sequel to the Kepler mission where we couldn't stare at that patch of the sky anymore. But there were actually, there was this like line of other fields on the sky that we could observe in the ecliptic, which is where the planets of our solar system are and where the sun and the moon are, uh, this band through the sky. It's also where the zodiac constellations are because the sun travels through the sky through the set of constellations, which is why we have the zodiac. So there was a set of fields that we could look at there um, so we did this whole second mission where we hunted for planets in a different part of the sky, and that one's found hundreds more planets. So all told, the Kepler spacecraft has found something like 3,000 planets. Wow. And the, the, the next edition of Kepler, in a way, is this uh, TESS, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So TESS is very cool. So remember I said Kepler had like a very specific statistical question, so it looked at one patch of the sky. And what we did was look at a, like 150,000 stars in this patch of sky and just over and over and over again for four years because we were looking for Earth-like planets that only transit once a year. So if you're an alien civilization looking at the sun and every 365 days you see a dip, that's from the Earth because that's how long it takes us to go all the way around the sun and come back to where we were. So that's why Kepler was looking at this one patch of sky for four years. Um, but what TESS is doing is almost exactly the opposite. Tess is looking at the whole sky, but just for short periods of time. So one month at a time, it's tiling the sky. So it's not going to as many stars and it's not going to as faint a star. So the stars it's looking at are all brighter, but it's doing every bright star in the sky. The reason that's interesting is because a lot of the planets that were found by Kepler were found around faint stars. Um, and that was fine for statistics because we just wanted to know like how common were planets. But if you actually want to examine each planet in detail, if you want to use other telescopes like Hubble or the Webb spacecraft that was just launched, then you want to have bright stars that are nearby so that the planet is giving off as much flux as possible. Whereas if you're, you know, a hundred times fainter, it's just that much harder to get the observations that you need. 
So Tess is looking at every bright star in the sky to find the closest, nearest, brightest transiting planets. And those are the ones that we can study in detail with Hubble and then Webb when Webb is doing science operations, which is hopefully in two months. Perfect. And so, I mean, of course, we started the discussion and because one question that I had was that how do we, um, or what do we call an exoplanet? Is it like within our galaxy solar system or it's beyond that? So, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I'm gonna say one thing, which is that it's still up for debate. Um, the International Astronomical Union, which is the big body of astronomers around the world who gets together and tries to agree on the definitions of things, doesn't actually have a, a like ratified voted on definition of exoplanet yet. So what I'm gonna tell you is what we at the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which is where I work, NASA has this archive where we keep track of all of the exoplanets. I'm gonna tell you what we call an exoplanet. So for us, an exoplanet is orbiting another star that's not our sun. So anything that's orbiting our sun is a planet. Anything that's orbiting a different star is an exoplanet. Uh, less than 30 times the mass of Jupiter, um, which is actually pretty generous because at some point above about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, we know that deuterium burning, um, so deuterium is like heavy hydrogen, um, deuterium burning starts in the core and then you probably have something that's more like a brown dwarf. But it's actually very difficult to make precise mass measurements at this mass range. So we, we have a little flexibility. Like if you have a 20 Jupiter mass thing, We'll, we'll put it in. It might be a brown dwarf, it might be a planet, but we'll, we'll put it in just in case. Um, and then it has to be in a refereed published paper. That's the other criteria. Um, so we do know, for instance, that already rules out something called free floating planets. So we have found something like a hundred planets, planetary mass things that are just floating out in our galaxy. So, you know, just hanging out. They don't seem to be associated with a star. Uh, so they might be planets. Um, they might be very, very small brown dwarfs, for instance, but they might be planets. Um, and then it starts to get into, well, does an exoplanet have to form around a star and then maybe get kicked out? There was this really cool paper that just came out this week, early this week by Sean Raymond. Um, so there's this theory that the four outer giant planets of our solar system, originally that there were five, uh, and that they interacted early in the solar system while the gas disk, the protoplanetary disk was still here, that they interacted and one of them got kicked out. And this could explain why we see these free floating planets in between the stars. So our galaxy has a hundred billion stars and it could have up to a hundred billion free floating planets if every star you know, managed to kick out a planet. So to come back to your question about what is an exoplanet, it's a planet outside our solar system at the moment, it's strictly a planet that's orbiting another star, but it might get extended in the future to include free floating planetary mass objects that might have formed around a star and got kicked out. It's very hard to like see a little spot on the sky and be like, hey, were you originally in a planetary system or did you form like that? Like interrogating them as to their formation is very difficult. So it would be frustrating if the definition of exoplanet included formation information because that there's just no way to track that. Um, so yes, of all of the things that meet our criteria, there's 5,014 so far. That's interesting. It's, it's good that we leave this thing out there that, okay, this can be an exoplanet. And uh, yeah. so now we go back to our, our discussion. So, and then the, so, so Kepler and Tess, they were doing wonderful job. Um, and then now it comes the James Webb telescope. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what do you think what's different there apart from this big unfolding of the wings? That they, oh they yeah. Were, uh, I mean, the technical <laughs> achievement that was mm -hmm. unfolding James Webb in space is incredible and just such a, such an achievement for humanity. Um, how is it different in terms of science? So, so Kepler and Tess, which I've described so far, so they use the transit method. So they're just measuring the brightness of star with the time and looking for dips. And they're just doing that um, in a very broad wavelength range. So over, over a wide range of wavelengths, they're just summing up all of the light and looking for dips. Um, and that's, that's because they're mostly small. Like Tess is only 10 centimeter cameras. Like you can go and buy a 10 centimeter telescope for a few hundred dollars off Amazon. Um, so Tess is actually very small. It's four 10 centimeter cameras. Um, so you need as much light as possible. So you're just adding up all of the light. What James Webb is gonna do, James Webb is a six meter telescope. So it's much bigger. Um, 
it's going to break the light up into different wavelengths. So for many of the planets, it's still going to do the same type of measurement, which is just measuring the brightness of the star as the planet goes in front. But now it's going to do it as a function of wavelength. Now, why that's interesting is if, if your planet has an atmosphere, like Earth has an atmosphere, molecules in that atmosphere absorb light at different wavelengths. So for instance, water absorbs at 1.4 microns, which is in the near infrared. So our eyes can't see it. Otherwise, the sky would just be opaque. Um, but telescopes who, that can measure at 1.4 microns can see it. So if you, were, if you were a telescope looking at an Earth transit, the planet would look a bit bigger because the atmosphere would be opaque in 1.4 microns because the water molecules in the atmosphere would absorb. But at 1.2 microns, where there's nothing absorbing, the planet would look a bit smaller because the atmosphere would suddenly be transparent and the sunlight could just go through it. So what you're actually doing is you're mapping out the size of the planet as a function of wavelength. And that tells you at what wavelengths there are absorbers in the atmosphere and at what wavelengths the atmosphere is transparent. And then you can use what you know about where does water absorb, where does carbon dioxide absorb, where does methane absorb, and reverse engineer, okay, what combination of molecules at what temperatures and pressures could have produced this, we call it a transmission spectrum because it's the spectrum of the starlight getting transmitted through the planet's atmosphere. So what James Webb will do is look at transmission spectra of nearby planets and actually be able to tell us what's in their atmospheres and at what pressure and, you know, are there clouds, are there hazes, is it clear, you know, it's so exciting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and as you mentioned that the the technical uh, achievement is is undeniably it's fantastic for for the humanity that we could uh, do all this and this one month long unfolding operation that went well. It's yeah, it's just fascinating. So the center over in Maryland that was in charge of it, um, I visited there a few times over the last decade, and in their cafeteria, so the place where they go to sit down and have a break. They have this big TV and many of the times that I was there, it was just showing an animation of what the unfolding sequence was look like, would look like. And every time I was there, I was like, this is not relaxing. Like I'm eating my lunch, like this is terrifying. Oh my God, so many things, like literally thousands of moving parts all have to work at the same, at the right time, at the right place. And I was just like, ah, this is a nightmare. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so now let's say that the since since we are talking about telescopes, maybe we can continue a little bit. So um, th so the first point is that uh, does size matter? I mean, uh, does it matter that the test is smaller and uh, J uh, the web telescope is uh, bigger? In, in it, it it really does, and in, in this sense, it does because um, it's all about how much how many photons you can get from the star. It's all about how much light you can get. So the fact that James Webb is bigger means that we have so much light, we can break it up into the different wavelengths and still see the signal of the planet, which is really very, very tiny. Um, so you can, do, you can do very basic measurements with small telescopes like TESS on bright stars. Uh, but if you want to do these detailed, like let's look for molecules in the atmosphere, you need heaps more photons. So you need a bigger telescope. So it does, in this sense, it does change the science you can do. You can still make amazing discoveries with small telescopes like TESS, uh, but the actual following up of those discoveries in detail needs to be done by bigger telescopes. And what about uh, where do you place in the space? Because that's also an interesting point. Um, I mean, uh, how far uh, they can be from the, from the Earth's atmosphere? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's really cool. So let's talk about TESS's orbit. So... TESS is in this really interesting orbit. It's not in a low Earth orbit, but like Hubble, and it's not very, very far away like Webb. Webb they sent out to L2, which is which is quite far away so that the Earth's atmosphere and, and radiation, the Earth's actually radiating, um, is, is not affecting it. So TESS is actually in this lunar resonant orbit. So the moon takes about 27 and a half days to go around the Earth. So TESS is in an orbit that's half that period, so about 13 and a half days, and it's slightly inclined to the plane. Uh, and, it's, and it's not a circle, it's an oval. It's like a long ellipse where the, where the Earth is at one end of the oval. So what it does is it spends most of its time quite far away from the Earth, so away from the atmosphere, away from the radiation, uh, collecting all of this nice stable data on the stars. 
The problem with being far away from the earth is when you want to download your data, it takes a long time and you need to spend a lot of money on a big antenna. Uh, and then you need to take a break in your observations to like point at earth and beam your data down. Um, so the very, very cool part about this orbit is even though Tess spends most of its time far away from the earth, once every two weeks, it zips past the earth really quick. Uh, and while it's here, you can just download all the data while it's nearby and then it goes out again and gets all of this nice data and then comes back and dumps it all. Uh, so it's actually really cool. And because it's in the resonance with the moon, the moon is actually doing the work of keeping the spacecraft in this orbit. Uh, we're sucking a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the moon's energy with this. Um, but that means we don't have to use any fuel. So James Webb, when it out at L2, is actually orbiting around L2. So L2 is a point that moves around the sun with the earth. Uh, and James Webb basically, basically is orbiting it. So it needs fuel. And that means that James Webb's life is limited by how much fuel we could send with it when we launched it. TESS doesn't have that problem because the, the moon is fueling us. We're like taking energy from the moon's orbit to keep us in this like high inclined elliptical orbit around the earth. It's so cool. It is, yeah. So um, then let's let's talk about um, uh, the exoplanets a, a bit more. So what about uh, the, so what, what is the most common exoplanet that we see in, in these five, 5,000 and stuff? Yeah, so, you know, when we started looking, we were already surprised by what we found because the first things we found were called hot Jupiters. So there were giant planets, like as big as the biggest planet in our solar system, but they were orbiting their stars in just a few days, every like two or three days. Uh, and this was crazy because, you know, when you looked at our solar system, we've got the like small inner rocky planets and the big outer gas giants. So for hundreds of years, people who've been trying to work out how did our solar system form, your theory basically had to reproduce small rocky inner planets and big outer gas giants, or it was wrong, right? Because we only had one example and that's what it looked like. And then as soon as we started looking around other stars, the first planets we found completely broke that because they were giant planets right next to the star. And it was like, wait, how did that get there? Could it have formed there? Does it need to form further out and then migrate in, but not migrate all the way in and get like swallowed by the star? It has to stop <laughs> like two or three days out. Like why, what's happening? Um, and it turns out those planets aren't very common, hot Jupiters. Only, you know, less than 1% of stars have a hot Jupiter, but they are the easiest to find, especially with things like the transit method because they're so big and they transit so quickly. You see many of them. Like if you were just looking at the star for a few weeks, you'd see many of these hot Jupiter transits because they're just a few days. So they're not common, but they're easy to find. So they were the first things we found. Of the 5,000, the most common kind of planet turns out to be, again, a surprise, something we don't have in our solar system, which is in between the size of the rocky planets. So we have the four rocky planets. And so Venus and Earth are about the same size. And then we have the four gas giants and the two smaller ones, Uranus and Neptune, are about four times the size of Earth. So we have the rocky planets and the gas giants. And in our solar system, there's nothing in between. If of those 5,000 planets, the most common kind of planet is in between. Um, so there's super Earths and mini Neptunes, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and they're a mystery. We actually don't know much about them yet. Uh, we don't know whether they're just big rocks. Like if you just took Earth and added more rock and made a bigger rock or whether they're small Neptunes. So Neptune has, we think a rocky core, but a very deep, volatile, rich atmosphere. So if you just shrunk that down a bit, um, or maybe it's a combination that we don't have in our solar system, like a very deep ocean world, for instance, would be the right density. Um, so it's very cool that the, the most common kind of planet so far seems to be uh, this kind of super earth thing that we don't have to study in detail in our solar system. Yeah, and the, the fact that you guys uh, study atmosphere, that's also quite interesting because once you imagine, um, I mean, on Earth, it's like maybe a few centimeters uh, layer of atmosphere. So how easy or difficult it is to study the atmosphere of exoplanets? Yeah, so, so gas giants, obviously, we see A, they're biggest, so they have the biggest signal on the stars, uh, and B, they have the deepest atmospheres, so the atmospheric features are much more obvious. So there are a few hot Jupiters that we've studied in a lot of detail, and um, we know things like 
the wind speed and the temperature difference between the day and the night and, you know, the structure of the atmosphere that, you know, how the pressure and temperature changes as a function of height in the atmosphere. So there's a few that we've been able to study in a lot of detail. Now, what we'd really love to do, right, is study these super Earths and mini Neptunes uh, and see, like, do you have a deep atmosphere or not? Because that will help us answer this question of whether it's more like a Neptune or more like an Earth. Um, and so far, we've been trying to do this with Hubble. And the frustrating thing is that so far, many of the atmosphere, many of the spectra that we get uh, are flat. So there's no up and down, you know, how I said, you measure the, you measure the size of the planet as a function of wavelength. So you expect to see a spectrum that has highs and lows, uh, and most of them are flat. Uh, and what that means is most of the atmospheres are cloudy. So, you know, in LA, in Los Angeles, where I am, it is often sunny, but today it is cloudy. Um, so if you were trying to look down on the surface of Los Angeles today, you would just see clouds. Um, and if the whole planet was covered in clouds, then you might learn a lot about the clouds, but you wouldn't learn much else, right? You wouldn't learn anything about the structure of the atmosphere and its dominant molecules when it's clear or what the surf if the surface has any features like continents or oceans or anything like that, you would just see a big length of clouds. And this is what we see when we look at Venus, right? Like in the night sky, Venus is just bright white because Venus has a very thick cloudy atmosphere, which means that for us, it's very hard for us to see down to Venus's surface. We have to look in wavelengths where the atmosphere is transparent, or we have to send little, <laughs> we have to send robots down that just immediately get crushed under the pressure and acid rain on Venus. <laughs> um, so it's hard, it's hard to see through clouds. Um, and so when we look at these mini Neptunes and super Earths, unfortunately, so far, a lot of what we're seeing is clouds. Um, but that's where Webb will help us um, because JWST uh, will be able to measure in enough detail that even that what looks flat to us now with Hubble, you might still be able to see some features with much, much more precise information that would at least tell you something more about the clouds. And how is it different to like finding a planet at the beginning? Uh, because that can be just one signal and then uh, studying more of its atmosphere, because I think that's that's where you need more data just simply like I don't know that you need to point out uh, the telescope to those to that certain um, planet and then get more data and how like how, what, how does it differ yeah so so NASA has what we call survey missions and those are things like Kepler and TESS and eventually in a few years the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope and those are the ones that are doing on many stars at the same time the very basic just like what has a good looking dip? And then, so then there's a bucket with thousands and thousands, it's more than 10,000 already candidates. So these are just stars that have dips. And then we have to do a lot more work to characterize those. And that's where it gets interesting because the different people, the different scientists have different science goals. So, you know, like this person might only care about hot Jupiters. So they're only going to follow up the hot Jupiter signals. And this person might only care about super Earths. So then they go to their telescopes and they say, hey, can I please have some time to look at this one and this one and this one? And the telescopes, the telescope allocation committees are like, um yes no maybe um so then you have to do a whole bunch of work to turn those candidate signals into good looking planets then once you have a planet that you know something about then you go to hubble and Webb, um and you say hey we've got this really cool planet please give us time so it does take you know from from starting the survey to finding the candidates to doing the work to turn them into like to, to understand if they're really planets or not to characterizing them is years it's, it's many years um tests because it's actually downloading the data every two weeks you can actually get a candidate and confirm it fairly quickly like a short number of months um but then still you know there's still only really an annual cycle to ask Hubble and Webb for time so you're still constrained um so this each step of the process takes time and uses different resources um and part of the trick is to get like a nice flow through efficient like candidate planet follow-up yeah, the uh, telescope alloc allocation committee that, that you mentioned, that's also interesting and in how it works. So any group can apply uh, to these to this committee and uh, can acquire the data on any of the telescopes? So, so each telescope usually has a time allocation committee uh, and there'll be rules about who is eligible for time and who isn't eligible for time. So for instance, NASA has time on the Keck telescopes. So in Hawaii, there's two 10 meter telescopes, Keck one and Keck two. 
Um, and anyone can apply to the NASA Keck time. You just have to say why it helps a NASA mission for you to do this science. So for instance, if you're following up test candidates, it helps a NASA mission because NASA is running tests and wants to make sure that all of the candidates get confirmed. Um, so I'm pretty sure anybody is eligible to apply to that time. Um, many of the telescopes also have protected time, which is only given to the people who like helped build the telescope or who put money into the telescope, like who helped pay for it. Um, so for instance, a bunch of the Keck time is only for the University of California university system um, because they helped pay for the original Keck. Uh, so each different telescope kind of has different buckets of money. But, oh, sorry. Each different telescope has different buckets of time that can get allocated out to different people. Um, so part of the, especially in the US, in North America, if you're at a small university, part of your challenge is to work out which buckets of time you're eligible for, which ones are open to the whole community. Uh, and then after that, which ones come with money, because uh, it's great to get time on a telescope, but if you don't have any money to support students or to support the analysis or to support the publication, then you then it's really tough. Yeah, and so since you mentioned about the candidate planets. Um, mm -hmm. So what is the difference between candidate planets and the confirmed planets? So do you get like a lot of candidate planets? And Yeah, so a candidate planet, a, a candidate is usually just, you just see that the star is dipping. Now the problem is, there's more than one reason why a star could dip. Uh, for instance, if you have two stars orbiting each other, one star blocks the other one and then the light dips a bit. Uh, so those are called eclipsing binaries. And then if you're looking at a bright star and like in the background behind the bright star is an eclipsing binary, you might just be adding up all of the light from that patch of sky with your telescope uh, and you see a little dip and you're like, ah, oh, it's a planet. But actually when you go and look in more detail, the bright star isn't changing, but there's an eclipsing binary in the background, which is changing. Um, so they were called astrophysical false positives. Stars also have sunspots, you know, so our sun has sunspots that come and go. And they're, you know, if you look, they're like the size of the earth. So you can imagine a dark patch comes onto the face of the star that's the size of the earth, it can change the brightness by the amount that an earth-like transit would. So stellar activity, so star spots coming and going uh, can also mimic a transit signal occasionally. Um, and then there are instrumental false positives where the telescope just burped or changed a bit of temperature and suddenly the amount of light falling onto that pixel changed a bit. Um, so there's lots of different false positives, we call them. So things that look like planets, but actually when you look in more detail, don't turn out to be planets. So a candidate is basically Kepler and K2 and Tess are just saying, here's a star that has a periodic dip about it. Uh, so there are actually something like 12,000 of those if you add up Kepler and K2 and Tess, and we're expecting many more from Tess. So that's when you have to go and get a whole bunch more observations and you have to like look in high resolution at the star and see, is it a single star or is it multiple stars? Uh, you get high resolution spectra of the star to be like, okay, is it a clean spectrum showing a single star that isn't very active? Um, and that obviously doesn't show like a second star in the spectrum. Um, and then you can actually start trying to measure the mass. So, so far we've just talked about transiting planets and transiting planets are the ones that block the light. But everything that has mass uh, you know, tugs on everything else that has mass. So in our solar system, Jupiter is actually dragging our sun around the middle of our solar system. So Jupiter's orbit is like 12 years. So if you were an alien civilization looking at our sun, you would actually see that it has this like periodic wobble on the sky pulled by this planet with a period of 12 years. So when we look at other stars, we see some of them wobbling. And so we can infer that there are planets orbiting those. So that's the, the second most prolific successful planet detection method is called the radial velocity method, which is like measuring the wobble of these stars on the sky. But what the wobble tells you is how massive the object is that's pulling the star. And what the transit tells you is how big it is, like its radius. So if you can combine the two, if you can measure the, how big something is from the transit and how massive it is from the radial velocity, well, now you have density, right? So you have mass and size. And that's where you can start to say like, this is a gas giant, this is a rocky planet and this kind of thing. Uh, so yes, you can get the, the, so when you're following up these candidates to truly confirm that it's a confirmed planet, the gold standard is to measure a mass and say, yes, it's definitely, you know, below 30 Jupiter masses. Yeah. And the, the, this change in the light of, of the stars, it has, or it will be once the, um, once the planet crosses the, 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 the same direction, right? I mean, if it's uh, 12 years, as you, as you mentioned, um, 
you won't be able to detect this one right in the in this short period of time yeah so that's why so of these 5000 planets that we've found so far the vast majority are what we call short period planets so they're planets that are really close to their star like less than 100 days so earth's orbit is 365 days almost all of the planets that we've found so far like 90% are closer to their star than earth is and that's just a bias because of what we're sensitive to you know in three decades when we've been doing these transit surveys for a very long time and doing these radial velocity surveys for a very long time we'll become more sensitive to the outer regions of these planetary systems and find planets out there but at the moment we just haven't been looking for long enough as you say there hasn't been a transit survey that's run for 12 years consistently i think maybe one maybe mirth <laughs> but it's hard to keep a transit survey running, survey running for a long time do you know uh, what is the longest uh, timing planet that we know uh, which yeah so the so there's another method that i haven't talked about yet which is called direct imaging now direct imaging is kind of what it says so you use a very clever instrument to just block out the light from the star and then you look for other points of light nearby very faint points of light um and so for young planetary systems uh so less than you know 100 million years old uh, so when the system's still really kind of forming and the gas is dissipating and the planets are interacting with each other, while the giant planets are still contracting, they're actually radiating out heat. So you can look for little heat signatures of giant planets around stars nearby. Uh, and that method is more sensitive to further away planets. Um, so, so direct imaging, I think there are about 60. Out of the 5,000 is about 60 planets that were found um, by actually just taking a picture of them and saying, hey, there's a planet. Um, but those ones, it's hard to find them close in because you've got to, you know, you're trying to block out the light from the star. So that's actually more sensitive to planets that are further away. So I think that there are, so HR 8799, which if you haven't seen it, please go and Google HR 8799 because there's actually a video of the four giant planets like orbiting around that star because we've actually been able to observe it over the last decade or so and actually see the planets moving. This is, a, this is why it's cool to take a direct image. Um, and what the outermost planet of those has a very long orbit, like I think it's, you know, it's out at 100 AU or something. So that's like thousands of years. Um, so so there are there are a couple of planets that we know that have very long periods, very far away from their star. But those are ones that we've detected with this other method. I, I was wondering about uh, these colorful images that we see, you know, so what are those colors in the in most of these images? Oh, yeah. So again so there's only about 60 planets where we've actually been able to take an actual picture and very few of those are um actually taken in multiple colors so anytime you see like a beautiful 3d rendering of an exoplanet that's an artist's rendition that's just a that's just a person an artist being like tell me everything you know about this planet and you say okay it's rocky there could be water there might be an atmosphere and the artist is like, great, got it. And they go and they create this whole new fantastical imaginary world that is your exoplanet. Um, uh, but yes, there's no actual science. There's no actual like data going into that. That's just them trying to take the very, very, very little that we know and imagine a whole world out of it. So yes, all of those colors are, are generally made up. That's that's the truth bomb now. Yeah, that's the truth bomb. They're <laughs> yeah. mostly made up. There is, there are, a very small number of planets, only two or three, where we genuinely do know what color they are. Uh, so one of them is one of these really well studied hot Jupiters that I mentioned before, HD 1897333b. And I'm sorry, they all have terrible names. Um, uh, so it's blue. It's a blue planet. You know how we have Uranus and Neptune, which are kind of like greeny blue. Uh, HD 1897333b is blue. Um, and then we have another planet. So I'm going to get the name wrong. I think it's GJ1214. That's like magenta. That's like this color um that's uh, glowing like a deep magenta uh so that's fun so we do know some colors but only because you know we've worked we've been able to study them in detail and that's what web is going to tell us web is going to give us a lot more actual colors because it's going to measure that as a function of wavelength the planet so you'll be able to see like this planet mostly emits in the blue or in the red so then we can see a, a lot of those before and after uh, images of the of planets yeah yeah this is what we imagined and this is what we see and yeah. i want to and you know we still won't be able to get proper photos for a very long time um so nasa actually just spent the last few years studying the idea of a very large telescope in space at least the size of web um with one of these direct images on it 
um, that will be designed to actually take pictures of planets like the Earth. But even those, like, I'm not talking about like a high resolution, beautiful, you can see cyclones and islands and atolls and stuff. It'll still be just like a little blob. Um, but if you watch the, uh, if you watch a little blob of the Earth over like a 24 hour period, um, you can actually start to map out like, okay, it's a blue blob and then it's a green blob and then it's a kind of brown blob and then it's a green blob again. And you can actually say, okay, so there's oceans and continents and deserts and stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. So how do you cat catalog these um, planets? I mean, um, so are they based on size or different parameters are you using? Yeah, so at the Exoplanet Archive, we basically try to grab everything you measure about your planet. Um, so we, we monitor the literature every day. So every day papers come out and we check to see if there's any new planets or updated parameters for old planets. Um, and basically, you know, the, all of these detection techniques that I've talked about, each of them only measures a small number of parameters like period and size or period and mass, or sometimes the if you have like how eccentric the orbit is, there's only a dozen or so parameters that people can actually measure at any given point. Uh, so we just grab them all. Um, so we have these big tables of data at the Exoplanet Archive that, um, and you can sort on any of these and filter on any of these, like here, here are all the ones with short periods, here are all the ones that are bigger than four times the size of the earth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we we track we try to track everything we can. <laughs> Do you have uh, biosignatures there already or? Ah, so <laughs> one of the things that we're building right now under the hood is a new atmosphere environment. So so until now, until Webb, there have only been, you know, a few planets that have been characterized in detail. And we do have transmission spectra in the archive that have been published from like Spitzer, which I didn't talk about yet, but another NASA spacecraft called Spitzer and Hubble. Uh, so we do have transmission spectra. Um, but we're, what we're anticipating with Webb is that there'll be so many more planets uh, that have well-studied atmospheres and well-detected molecules, right? You'll be able to say this has ozone or oxygen or you know methane and so what our goal is to keep a catalog of all of the all of the molecules that have been found now interestingly like you ask about biosignatures there's still a lot of active work right now as to what what would be like a smoking gun biosignature what would be the molecule you would see in that atmosphere and be like 100 percent, it has to be life there's no nothing else that could do that and it's interesting because there are Bio, there are geological processes that make oxygen uh, and there are geological processes that make methane and there are geological processes that make ozone. Um, but actually trying to get all three of those together in the same place is hard um, geologically. Just in, if you think about the processes that have to be happening to produce each of those, it's actually hard to get all three. But life does all three. Uh, so it might be the case in the end that it isn't one molecule where it's like, ah, there it is but it's a combination of molecules that kind of indicates that the atmosphere is not in equilibrium, that it's, that something's happening to drive the atmosphere out of equilibrium, like life, for instance. So what do you think, what will help uh, help us more? It's, do you think J, JWST would do the job or we need, we need something more for these biosignatures? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So I talked before about, you know, how hard it was for Kepler to find rocky planets. And we still don't have any confirmed Earth-like planets around other stars. What we do have are a bunch of confirmed rocky planets that are in the habitable zones of M dwarfs. So our sun is a G star, just a boring middle-aged yellow star. Most of the stars in the galaxy are actually M dwarfs, which are smaller and cooler and redder than our sun. And because they're smaller, it's easier to find signals of planets around them because the planet blocks a higher fraction of the light as it goes in front of it. Um, so Webb isn't powerful enough to look for biosignatures in the atmospheres of Earth-like planets around stars like the sun, which is fine because, again, we haven't found any. What Webb is powerful enough to do is to look at the atmospheres of these rocky planets around M dwarfs. Now, there's a lot of activity around M dwarfs, uh, both in the stellar sense in that M dwarfs put out a lot of radiation. So you know how the sun has sunspots. M dwarfs are like that to the max, like a million percent. M dwarfs are always flaring and putting out high energy, high energy radiation. So there's a lot of activity on the part of astronomers to try and work out whether a rocky planet around an M dwarf could be habitable. Like maybe there's just so much high energy radiation coming out of M dwarfs that any life would just get sterilized, right? This rock would just be a bare rock. Maybe its atmosphere would be stripped away by all of the stellar winds coming out of these very active M dwarfs. Um, so 
one of the things that Webb will do is let us go and look at some of these atmospheres and look for biosignatures. And it might be the case that the first biosignatures, biosignatures we find aren't planets around stars like the sun, but they're planets around M dwarfs. Interesting. And uh, are there um, new missions which are about to come for, uh, for that they look for uh, biosignatures specifically? So that's what we've been looking at an idea for for a long time. Um, it's probably still at least two decades away, um, but we do have ideas and we just need to get money now um, to finish developing the technology and actually build it and launch it. Um, so NASA has prioritized working on that idea uh, for the next decade and seeing if it actually seems feasible. Um, and then maybe next decade, we actually start building it and launch it. Um, but NASA has committed to actually at least looking at the idea. That's great. I mean, at least by, the, by that time, if uh, chemists and biologists, they can also contribute a little bit more in kind of understanding what are better biosignatures uh, that we can look for, that'll be, mm -hmm. of course, a great contribution. Yeah. So in the meantime, in the next two decades, I'm, I really need chemists and biologists and astrobiologists to go off and like think about biosignatures and like what kinds of life could create what kinds of signatures that we could then see in the atmospheres. So it's really great that all this work is happening in parallel. Exactly. So uh, what's, what's uh, your now next step? Like, so you'll continue working with the test. How, how long the test would work or? Yeah, so tests could work for another 20 years. Again, because of this orbit, because it doesn't need fuel, because it can just hang out, uh, it could potentially go for another 20 years. Uh, so I'm really interested in um, demographics. So these, que these statistical questions of how common different kinds of planets are. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do with TESS is because the stars that TESS is looking at are so bright, we actually know a lot about them. And one of the things we know about them is their, is their chemical abundance profile, we call it. So how much hydrogen, helium, lithium, boron, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, all of these different things, um, we can measure those relative amounts. Uh, and what I would like to know uh, is do different kinds of stars with different kinds of abundance profiles make different kinds of planets? Um, that would be really cool because that would tell us something about the physics that's happening. So that's the next question I'm trying to answer with Tess. Perfect. So let's hope that soon uh, this the, the exponential curve will reach uh, 50,000 and probably across uh, 100,000 as well. And then Yeah, we, we, think, we think we're going to get to a million in like a decade. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that'll be amazing, right? Yeah. And of course, then if we have a few of them that we can also look more uh, into the detail to find um, alien life, that'll be, that's exactly. hiding the dream. That's the holy grail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation, coming onto the podcast and sharing. I, I can't say that this, I think this is like the, the the dream of humanity to find and to look outside the the planet, right? So right, it's like yeah. one of our oldest questions: like, exactly. are we alone? Exactly. But it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting yeah. me. Thank you so much.